right, so who's ready for our first speaker? <laughs> Great. Um, our first speaker, her name is Victoria Zerps. When she isn't doing philosophy student things at the University of Sydney, she's probably doing comedy with Freudian Nip or editing a student paper on Issoir. When she's not doing anything, the things she's recharging in a subterranean battery pod. Probably some lizard thing, I imagine. <laughs> so please welcome to the stage, Victoria Zerbst. Good evening, scholars, students, and hangers on. Tonight, I will be sharing an evolutionary hypothesis that explains why birds sing. Charles Darwin once hypothesized that bird vocalization evolved through sexual selection. However, since researchers at the Australian National University disproved his research in 2014, a plausible theory <laughs> has come to light outlining that human beings have selected for the evolutionary existence of songbirds because these songbirds are pleasant on the human ear. So we have spared vocalising birds from predatory hunting out of admiration, and they've been selected for because of their aesthetic value. <laughs> However, this theory is limited in addressing bird vocalisation of a repulsive nature. What, for example, explains sounds like this? <laughs> I mean, what is the evolutionary function of these horrendous sounds? Why have we not hunted these species of birds to death? <laughs> well, fellow scholars, we cannot answer this question if we insist that human beings cultivate bird ecosystems based on aesthetic judgments, or even the desire to maximize human happiness through positive sensory stimuli. We can, however, offer the, um, we can have, uh, explain the data much better if we assume a different primary motivating factor in deciding which species of birds we select for or against. That motivating factor, fellow scholars, is human judgmentalism. <laughs> it is, in fact, the human desire to hear, compare, and judge voices <laughs> that serves as the only viable natural selector for the complete spectrum of avian vocalization we hear today. So it was psychologist Alfred Adler's theory of superiority, published in 1912, that has formed the basis of our research into human judgmentalism and its impact on interspecies relationships. So in the same way that we not only tolerate, <laughs> but enjoy watching hours of less than palatable human attempts of vocalization, we tolerate and even select for the existence of bizarre sounding birds. So here's a table that delineates feelings associated with reactions to vocalization. So here we have pleasant vocals. Uh, the primary reaction is happiness, which leads to stress relief. Terrible vocals. The primary reaction is judgment <laughs> and superiority, which then lends itself to happiness. Then we have the curious case of combination vocals. The primary reaction here is confusion, <laughs> which then turns into judgment and superiority. So in 2012, research scientist Sarah Eep from Emory University theorized that bird vocalization is processed mathematically in the same way humans process their own song. This proves <laughs> that human beings have both the agency and the ability to hear these birds, judge the timbre of their tone, and choose not to hunt them to extinction. This research may also explain why we love watching experts linguistically challenge and destroy contestants on The X Factor, The Voice, and Australian Idol. These are our experts. Uh, so this uh, sound discovery uh, not only explains bird vocalization, but also uncovers a threat to birds all over the world. Trends have become more apparent. 
uh, of the increase in vocal competitions, which correlate almost directly with the decrease in bird population. Now, those are both those are both true. Uh, true lines right there. Uh, so it seems that human beings have found a secondary evolutionary outlet for their need to judge sound. And as a result, our avian populations have begun to dwindle. In 1957, we saw the extinction of the golden crowned mannequin. The same year, Eurovision was broadcasted <laughs> all over the world. In the year 2000, we lost 22 birds to extinction. The same year, the TV show Pop Stars first aired in New Zealand and resulted in 40 spin-off shows worldwide. <laughs> in June 2002, the King Island Scrubbit, Capricorn Yellow Chat, and Mount Lofty Ranges Spotted Quail Thrush were added to the endangered species list. That was the same month American Idol debuted to millions of human listeners. <laughs> Most recently, and quite close to home, in April 2012, the last surviving Kakapo birds were moved to predator-free predator islands exactly two days after Delta Goodrum <laughs> started judging the voice. <laughs> I mean, the evidence is staggering. <laughs> but this all begs the question, how will bird populations respond to this phenomenon? Is the only way we can preserve natural sounding birds by instigating almost a, an auto-tuning of uh, squawky birds that we listen to? Will we be left with the futile reality of this adaptation? Fellow scholars and non-scientists, <laughs> it is up to us to decide whether we believe birds of all vocal abilities have the X factor to stay in this competition we call life. Thank you. Yeah.